It's Good Friday. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I read, I took some time this week, and I wrote, uh, read Matthew chapter 26 and 27. And I have to be honest with you, it's a tough read. But there's so much there. And I think it's good that we all read it regularly. Just to remember the depth of what Easter means, and particularly Good Friday. Um, I sometimes struggle with it probably the same way you would, by asking myself, who would want to hear about the torturous death of their best friend? Who would, who would actually go through that? Yet, this is one of the two things that Jesus left behind for us to do. He said, do this in remembrance of me, the Lord's Supper, every time we take communion, which I would encourage you to do tonight. Ask the question, say, you know, what was this for? What is the meaning of this? Why is Good Friday so important? Easter is necessary to demonstrate the lengths that God was willing to go to provide for my salvation. You know, at times like this, we look for hope. We look for rescuers. Uh, we look to the government to provide. We look for the CDC to, you know, be able to uh, to weed these things out, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and things like that. But ultimately, our salvation comes from God. You see, Easter is really the, the most significant and most um, impactful rescue operation of all time. It, it quite literally is a rescue operation for a whole race of people. It's God reaching out, paying the price, um, covering everything for a total rescue of the mind, body, and soul. And it, it demonstrates that, that God's love for us was so deep and so significant that he was willing to uh, embark on this high-risk um, adventure, so to speak, and the sacrifice in order to see us come to Christ. Um, Dr. Fred Barlow writes, The cross of Christ shows us that God's love is of deepest descent, universal distribution, and of eternal duration. It is a total rescue. Uh, Derek Timbo writes, At the heart of the universe is one who not only loves us, but has made his love known in the most unforgettable way. And N.T. Wright writes, The cross, in fact, is a redeeming turning point of history. It is a goal of Israel's strange covenant story as a result is God's way of healing his world. So we need it to understand the willingness of God and the, and the depths to which he was willing to go to express his love to us. The second thing we need Good Friday for is we as people need to see the solution to suffering and sin in order to survive it. And what, what do I mean by that? The example of Christ, um, seeing what he did for us, answers the question, God, God, why is there suffering and sin, and what is the solution to it? Um, the solution is Easter. And he right again writes, what happened in Jerusalem that Friday afternoon This was not was what the temple was always pointing to. It was a place where the pain and sin and shame and guilt of all the world of all people, of all history, was concentrated and was dealt with once and for all. And so when we are experiencing sin and suffering or we are seeing the consequences of it, and it can be heartbreaking, we look with hope to the cross. We look to hope um, to the Easter account in order to demonstrate to us there is an answer for these things. There is a solution to it. The third thing is the cross doesn't skirt the issue of suffering. It navigates us right through it. It's a navigational tool. Um, whatever is ahead, Jesus suffered it first. His death is an inspiration of the meaning of what it means to be in pain. And quite literally, um, Christ didn't solve the cross. He suffered it, is a quote I've heard. Another quote says, The cross is scandalous. It confronts all human religion and philosophy. It is a strange instrument by which God has shattered the old world and brought a new one into being. When, we, um, when we're going through suffering, I don't know about you, but the questions I always ask are, you know, when will it end? Um, why am I here? You know, is there anything I could have done differently that would not have led me to this place? There's a lot of introspection in suffering. 
but ultimately um, the goal that all of us have is to somehow come out the other side um, suffering expressed in the cross uh, is the deepest darkest road but Jesus went through it um, in such a meaningful way and I, I don't want to infringe too much on this really my next point but um, the way he navigated it he didn't stand down from it he didn't run from it there's a there's a verse in in uh, the Bible and the Gospels where it talks about Jesus is interacting and he's setting out for Jerusalem it's his last time to set out for Jerusalem he knows he's gonna die and and the verse says and I'm trying to remember the language a little bit but is it just set his face resolute you know resolutely to head to Jerusalem he just determined I am going to do this he knew everything that was ahead and he still determined to do it so when we face suffering we can face it not try to escape from it but we can face it and we can navigate through it with courage because Good Friday demonstrates that it's possible the fourth point is is I can suffer with hope because Jesus demonstrated a victory over it um, as I was mentioning in my former point, when I'm going through suffering, I, I'm looking the other side. I want to get through it. I want to, I want to solve it, so to speak. Um, but often it gets darker before the dawn. I mean, that's not just literally a great quote from the dark night, but it, it's true. There's this darkness Jesus had to go through, but he did, um, he did survive, not survive it, but he did um, emerge victorious over it. And for the follower of Jesus Christ, sometimes we miss or we forget that we are basically indestructible. And by that, what I mean is, is they can kill our bodies. And a sickness can take us. An accident can take us. We, in our human bodies, are very frail. But our souls in Christ are um, quite literally invulnerable. And by that, what I mean is, is no matter what we face, it's all temporary. It's all, it's all something that at a time in, in our futures, in eternity, we will look back on as, as, as just a, a blip in our lives. Quite literally, Paul called the sufferings he went through. And Paul, Paul probably had a master's degree in suffering. I mean, the guy, he was tortured. He was, they threw rocks at him. He was almost drowned. Like it's just the stuff this guy went through. I, he probably had more scar tissue than skin. Um, but Paul once said, he said, these light and momentary troubles is what he called them. And I'm thinking, that's a crazy thing to say. But, but for a follower of Christ, that's really true. When we suffer and we suffer well, we have this hope. And this hope is, is that they can do whatever they want to us. But in the end, God wins. And, and Christ demonstrated that by navigating right through the pain and the suffering of the cross. Um, John Stott wrote this. He said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In a real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? And God wasn't immune to it. He worked right through it. I never forget a number of years ago, there was a, a video uh, at Cambridge University in England. Someone had introduced a motion to eliminate or to eradicate all organized religion from Cambridge uh, University campus and, and, and things like that. It was probably some uh, atheist, you know, some philosophy student that believed in atheism. Anyways, it was a real big deal. And they brought in uh, three speakers for both sides of the argument. On the one side were three atheists, including Richard Dawkins, who is probably the granddaddy of atheism right now. And on the other side, they had uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a Muslim scholar, and another atheist, strangely enough. And they were arguing against the motion. So anyways, it was interesting. Uh, one of the things that was interesting, a side note, every student got up was in support of this motion that said something. You would have thought most of them supported it. But anyways, the, the, the speaker spoke. I, I had to say probably the weakest speaker on the against motion was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was a well-spoken gentleman, but there was... There wasn't really a lot of meat in what he had to say. The Muslim scholar was brilliant. Like this guy was awesome. Um, and he, he had some really interesting points and some really nice things to say. And the way he approached it too, he was quite likable. But the most brilliant was the atheist. The atheist was a man who um, I don't know a lot about, but he must have a lot of Christian friends. And he got up against the motion and, and he just basically ripped it apart. Like the, just, it was a, a mastery in apologetics. It really was. He did a great job. But one of the things he said I thought was really interesting. He said, let's admit it. Atheism's dirty little secret 
is it has no answers for questions of pain and suffering, forgiveness, and grief. He called it atheism's dirty little secret. He said the only answers for those questions are found in faith and in the cross of Christ. Like, this is amazing. Um, he, he, he quite literally demonstrated that, that it, you know, it's really easy when you're, you know, you're healthy and everything like that to believe there's no God. But when we're in suffering and those answers come through, the belief that there's nothing there is inadequate. It leads to despair. And I'm not trying to make an intellectual argument that we should believe in God because we need to. I'm saying that it makes more sense that there is a God who has suffered and who has had victory over it. And this is the only way to a victorious life. Other ways lead to despair. Um, one scholar wrote, do not fear death, but rather the inadequate life. And Christ's demonstration of victory at the cross and the resurrection is, 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 is a hope, a signal, a light for us that though life is hard and we go through horrific suffering, we will be victorious over it. My final Good fr um, Friday statement is this. Every time I question God's salvation, the cross is a towering statement of the power of his power to provide it. Um, I, I've got to, uh, you know, I look at the cross of Christ and I look at the Good Friday message and I, and I say, this, this was so audacious, so complete, such a huge sacrifice, so much had to happen to bring it about. And it was such a total occurrence that I have to believe it worked. It worked because God took that handful of people who were witnesses to it, uneducated people from the backwoods, people that society overlooked and quite literally transformed the world with it. Some people say the greatest argument to the, the, um, the fact of the resurrection is the fact that it's the, the believers of Christ were so willing to die for this. Who would be willing to die for a lie in such completeness? There are no, um, you know, autobiographies written by people in the first century who said, oh yeah, we made it all up or anything like that. They all died and they died in the millions. And it had such an impactful um, effect on the world at the time. By 200 AD, there were 20 million Christians, which is basically about one of every four people. And that's after two centuries of Christians being killed for their faith. One could only imagine how many uh, more followers of Christ would have, would have survived during that had they not, their lives not been taken by the Roman Empire. There's an amazing statement that this quite literally transformed the world and continues to transform the world today. You know, what Jesus is doing in the world and the, the salvation and the power he's providing for people isn't documented a lot in the press, but it's there. It's there. It's there in so many places. In the 1940s into the 50s, when the communists overtook China, the missionaries were expelled by the communist government. There were a handful of Chinese Christians. And uh, the belief was, uh, they called it the bamboo curtain. Once it descended, there was a lot of angst over whether the church would survive in China. About 40 years later, in the 1980s, um, China began to embrace uh, a little more capitalist or a little more free market system. When they did that, it enabled Christians to actually ch um, travel into China. What they found was shocking. This handful of Christians, a few thousand that had lived 40 years before, had grown to over 40 million followers of Christ. They, they worked, lived in house churches and there were underground um, Bibles that were, you know, brought around and, and there were pastors training on the go and, and the church had exploded in China. It was absolutely mind boggling, but that's the power of God's salvation. You try to press it down, you try to do away with it, and it just takes off. Some of the greatest revivals and, and greatest movements of Christ right now are happening in countries like India and Iran right now. It is quite literally an international faith and salvation. Easter is being um, taught and believed and is changing lives all over the world. And with each life changed, there are beautiful things happening. People are serving their neighbors. They're living sacrificially. They are providing for the poor. They are lifting the cause of the oppressed. 
um, there's such beautiful things happening in so many of these countries. And like I said, we don't hear a lot of it. It doesn't make the news. But boy, God is at work in his world. Easter is, um, is still happening everywhere. It's a statement of God's power to provide his salvation. Philip Brooks writes, we may say that the first Good Friday afternoon was completed the great act by which light conquered the darkness and goodness conquered sin. This is the wonder of our Savior's crucifixion. Charles Spurgeon wrote, the marvel of heaven and earth, of time and eternity is the atoning death of Jesus Christ. This is the mystery that brings more glory to God than all creation. Amazing. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for Good Friday. Thank you for the sacrifice that you paid in order to provide salvation and that we could join your family, that we become your sons and daughters, the God we could experience a reward in this life of life to the fullest, that you could provide hope for us for the future and eternity in your presence. There are no words, God. We don't always understand every aspect of it. And in suffering, sometimes we lose that glimpse but help us, Father, to look at the cross, look at Good Friday, look at the Savior, the suffering um, servant, Savior, Jesus Christ, and have hope in our lives. He overcame the cross. He rose from the dead. And God, we can live in that victory. God, fill our hearts with hope, our lives with power, our future with light. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us.